All right, so uh, my task is to inform you about Latin America and its regional implications. Uh, when I originally thought about this, I pulled up a map because I don't know much about Latin America. As everyone's been saying, we haven't debated it in a long time. But I knew it was south of Texas, uh, and that was confirmed. Uh, so that's where we're debating. But then I put this map in here, and one of the biggest things when you read the literature is this giant country of Brazil really matters. Um, if you just look at the size of Brazil with the rest of Latin America, you could probably guess that it's a regional hegemon. That most of the action that happens in Latin America, whether it be uh, political or economic, engagement with Brazil is a priority to the larger uh, Latin America area. Anyone want to guess if Brazil is an ally or an enemy of the United States? What do you think? Ally? Yes. Uh, Brazil is like our hub to Latin America that we've used over the past 20 years. The reason to why Joseph and I were just talking, the reason why Brazil wasn't included in the paper is because we can't really increase economic engagement with Brazil because we're engaging it a lot. So that being said, this, air, this country of Brazil will be a large counterplan on the topic. The way that the topic will, fo will focus uh, through the United States, but in many, many authors believe that Brazil should rise in its own leadership role uh, throughout Latin America. So that's just kind of a precursor to the size of what Latin America is. And then when I started thinking about if Brazil's going to act, how does the United States act, it dawned on me that, you know, for the most part when we debate, we use terms like realism or neoliberalism or the state or the nation state, and we never really have lectures about how that works. Sure, when you get to college, if you become a political science major, an IR major, we'll start talking more about theory. But I thought that maybe the beginning of this lecture should work about what the state is, who the state is, and how regional actors work. So, the agenda for today, international relations theory. Secondly, IR theory in Latin America. And then finally, the United States and Latin America relations, the status quo. What actors are intervening, what impact areas will be large, and how to write an advantage. Okay, so IR theory. When we say the state, we're talking about an independent country. In the common speech, when we refer to the state, when we're talking about in the United States, we often talk about Texas or Louisiana or any of those. In international relations, the state is the larger nation state. In modern international relations, an independent country is afforded sovereignty by international law agreements, and precedents. Anyone know the most recent state to become a country? Yeah. Is it South Sudan? No. Just declared independence uh, like a year and a half ago? Yeah. South Sudan? Well, South Sudan, yeah, and it's like, at the same time, but the one that I'm thinking about is more uh, along the lines of Kosovo. Their independence really shattered the regional balance because Russia referred to them as a satellite state. And the reason why this is important is once they declared independence, international law agreements and precedents made other countries, i.e. Russia, recognize that independence. The thing about a state is they have recognized international borders. The Mexico laugh is right in a port of entry is affirmative, right? That port of entry has to do with our land border with Mexico. Is it cool if Mexico is just like, guess what? Our new border is Houston. No. no. That works the same way as any state in Latin America. Even if there are states that are enemies with each other, there's internationally recognized borders that allow large sovereign countries to determine what action takes place. And the modern state does something that it used to do, didn't do in the past. It supplies public goods. Roads and education, it regulates economic relations. And moreover, the state seeks legitimacy in the eyes of its citizens and others. This part of the definition of the state matters for Latin America. Because there are places, i.e. Venezuela, Colombia, and have you guys paid attention to the news lately? What's going on in Brazil? What's happening in Brazil right now? Yeah. The referee got beheaded. They what? The referee that got beheaded. 
Okay, they definitely beheaded a referee. That's true. But what is the larger reason? What's going? Why? Why is there so much violence happening in Brazil? Yeah. Uh, they're really mad about the economic or the economic standpoint the government's taking. They're putting things into like making things fanciful around the town where people are starving. What are they making them fanciful for? Uh, the uh, soccer. I know it's soccer. World yes, World the World Cup. Yes, Brazil made a bill to host the World Cup coming up. In order to host the World Cup, you have to build really nice stadiums. You have to make your country look good to support tourism. Brazil decided to use, quote, unquote, slave labor to build all these stadiums. They're refusing to pay the people and using all of the excess money to invest in soccer stadiums instead of building roads or education. The people are rioting. When the state no longer seeks legitimacies in the eyes of the citizens, that state will lose credibility internally. All right, so from a state, we have what's known as a nation. A nation is a group of people with a claim to a shared past, common culture, and collective destiny. Nations are usually or sometimes coextensive with the state. They form large nation states throughout history. Mongolia is an example of that. You guys know who Genghis Khan was? That dude was awesome at winning wars. Uh, he conquered a lot of Asia, pretty much all of it. Uh, and from there, when even the empire started to slowly fall, because so many people were underneath their, their culture, that a nation state was formed. Later, like China rolled up and said, we claim you, but that's another story. Some nations struggle for autonomy and sovereignty and may lie entirely within a state. Um, so in Canada, there's Quebec. And like every six, year, six years, Quebec's like, we're going to succeed. And they're like, we're going to become our own country. And they put it to a popular vote. Like the people literally can vote on to be Quebec or be Canada. Um, or across state borders. Like, I'm sure you all know where Iraq is, considering we like invaded it and owned it for a while. But Kurdistan used to be part of, or within Iraq. It's also in Iran, Turkey, and Syria. These are people without a country. They are a culture. They're united, but they lack a geographical landmass to be a state. So a nation can exist without its own sovereignty. And when we talk about nations, we have to know what nationalism is. Nationalism is a passionate defense of our national interests, either in a nation-state framework. So when we're getting really jazzed, like over the 4th of July, that's called patriotism. Because we have a state. We have our independence, and we celebrate that. Or outside of the framework of a nation-state, where people act out, Hypernationalism can be referred to as things as treason and terrorism. And we usually try to suppress those violently. So the difference between nationalism being patriotic and it being a terrorism or what we would see as violent reactions is based upon having a state. If you have a sovereign border, it's patriotism. If you don't and you act up, it's a form of terrorism. So, how did we get here? How have we gone from growing up without states, to nations, to empires? Kind of if we look at it historically, we've had large empires. They've been multi-state, multi-ethnic political entities. They were created and sustained by force. The Holy Roman Empire is to note of this, like when you study like world history. It came to an end, the Treaty of Westphalia. This treaty is important. We're going to talk about it in a second. But it pretty much said that the idea of an empire or the idea of a state need no longer be based on a religious affiliation. <coughs> Prior to the Treaty of Westphalia, states often were tied to whatever religious standpoint applied.
There are other examples which, which didn't end the Ottoman Empire. Lasted all the way to World War I. A very large empire was the British Empire. This is the part that's important, the side over here. Empires don what we call as imperialism or colonialism. When we talk about Latin America, imperialism and colonialism matter a lot. Just like Britain came to the United States and began to colonize us, Latin America has had many different colonizers. When we talk about imperialism, colonialism, we're talking about how the Europeans and the Americans were dominant over poorer countries. But not only did we hold economics above them, but we militarily exploited the population for its resources. In the 20th century, Colonialism has kind of given way to the idea of hegemony. We don't outright make it our state, but we rely on our cultural and economic dominance without the overt use of force. In the 20th century, we also saw a new name for this. We called it soft power, and so then it became good. Oh, if they want to be like us, then sure, it's cool to make them like us. The current form of the hegemonic world is a U.S.-dominated or U.S.-centered place. Remember that map of Latin America, how big Brazil is? You would think a country like that would be able to institute its power within Latin America, but yet the United States still treats Latin America like its own chessboard. And finally, the Cold War marked the U.S. rise to the position of global power. Once the U.S. won the Cold, po Cold War, we entered a, year, a world of unipolarity. There isn't another power that can check the United States. That type of unipolarity spurred supranational organizations and international alliances. Think of the European Union. That is a collective group of states that have found it more, have a vested interest in coming together. NAFTA is another example where you involve the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Mexico. All right. So how do we get to the modern state? It's defined by three characteristics. This part of the theory concept of the lecture will matter in all of your debates that involve the critique. And in 70% of every debate you have, there will be a K. Why I cheer for that other 30%, reality is sunk in. So the state, what does it mean? We're talking about the territorial boundaries, its sovereignty, and its monopoly on the legitimate use of force. A state is defined when it can legitimately use force, when it has its own territorial boundaries, i.e. it can support and protect those boundaries, and when it has its sovereignty to install and maintain the government of its choice. The origin of this state was the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. It originated from the Thirty Year War from 1618 to 1648. What was going on? Well, prior to the Treaty of Westphalia, the political authority of a state resided within the church. The church monitored the control of land and taxation. And the government was, well, think of any example you have in world history uh, where there's kings and yet the Pope controlled what the kings would do. I'm not going to go into detail of how the war, the 30 year world came to an end. You don't need to know all that. But what you do need to know is that it gave individual rulers in the Holy Roman Empire the right to govern their land free of external interference. There was no longer one 
control of all of them. And it allowed them to keep any land they had won during the war or confiscated from the church. So how does this create, 400 years later, the system of the state empire we have now? Well, it ended unity under the Catholic Church as the organizing principle for Europe. Prior to this, states were conquered and kept in the name of the church, i.e. the Holy Roman Empire. This moment where we no longer thought the church would lead the state is the modern principle of sovereignty. And that principle is supreme and independent political authority of the nation state within its own territory. So whatever border you control, you have political authority of your own territory. Why is this important? What does it matter that states are independent political authorities and no longer have a higher power to guide them? How would this influence government? Yes? They have to justify their reasons besides the fact they can't say uh, the Pope told me to do it? Or right. It means that citizens can now question what the government does. The state has to justify its use of power. But it also means that states can pick their own governments. It allows for the idea of like the spread of democracy. It allows for the idea of the spread of communism. States are no longer subject to a higher power. Religion is no longer the central authority on the creation of the state or what the state provides. Okay, so in international relations, when we talk about Latin America, we're talking about theoretical opinions of how the world operates. So first we have to know what theory is. When we talk about international relations theory, when we talk about economic engagement with Latin America, we're discussing a different types of lens to explain, predict, and prescribe policy. So in debates, when someone reads a neoliberalism K, and you answer the K with things like capitalism inevitable, or realism is good, what we're having here is debates about international relation theory. Those debates are about the way we explain, predict, or prescribe policies to the world. It's important to note that a theory doesn't need to explain all the facts because every theory is suited to explain some facts but not others. There isn't a one-size-fits-all theory that explains everything. It's the reason why we have debate. This part though, theory is a generalizable account of how the world works that goes beyond the specific details of one unique case. Theory incorporates details beyond one example. In every practice debate that I've seen during the first week of camp, debaters always ask the question, explain it this one time. Right? International relations doesn't work like that. <coughs> Theory application, the way that we debate, goes beyond the specific detail and has to account for how it works beyond each example. If you want peace, democratize, as democracies do not wage war with each other. Right? That's an example of how in known society, in known times since democratic peace theory, democracies do not engage in war with each other. There are limits to international relation theories. No single theory can explain everything. When we talk about realism, liberalism, 
and constructivism here in a moment, you all will have questions like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? They're theoretical applications. They can't explain everything. We attempt to understand the world and prescribe action based upon known events. So why do we choose and use theories? They're unavoidable. Our understanding of the world are all informed by theoretical assumptions. Everything you know, not just about the world, but the world around you, is done by your self-conscious. How you exploit the world around you is based upon how you can understand it. So when we have debates like your ass versus the K, realism versus constructivism, all that's saying is how should we interact with the world and what prescriptions should we use to solve problems? <coughs> All right. There's three theories we'll discuss today. And these three sum up the way policy debate interacts with critical debate pretty well. Realism, liberalism, and constructivism. I was going to put Marxism in here, but I held off on that because I guarantee when we have our little mini breakout stuff, we talk about the postmodern world, it will involve things like post-critical discussions of Marxism and, and other stuff, but that spurs from what constructivism is. So we'll talk about realism, liberalism, and constructivism. All right, realism. There's two types, classical realism and neorealism. When we refer to classical realism, we're talking about three main authors. Thucydides, or Thucydides, Machiavelli, and Morgenthau. When we refer to neorealism, we're talking about, well, I'll say that, I think you guys know this person, but I'll save it for a second. All right, so who's Thucydides, and why do we care? Thucydides, sorry. Okay, this guy lived a long time ago. Um, but what's awesome about this is his work from 431 BCE, when he watched the Peloponnesian Wars, still holds true for today. He attempted to explain the war between Athens and Spartan as two different poles in the Greek system. That as they were developing, they were both at the heights of their power. He made an observation that the rising power of Athens, and that this fear caused Sparta, to distribute its power equally. So the beginning thought process of balance of power. That states attempt to manage and control not only their own power, but the power of their neighbors. So this has influenced the way that we study conflict, geopolitics, and international relations. Because power is central and conflict is inevitable. Because states attempt to balance each other, as one grows more powerful, the other one does the same, conflict becomes inevitable. <clears throat> because of this, only power can stop other people from ignoring your political position. So the state's job to consolidate power and to balance the other states. Then came Machiavelli, who wrote from the same position that states are inherently powerful and that conflict is inevitable. He wrote a book called The Prince. When all of you go to college, you'll read this. If you haven't read this, it's not really a difficult book to read. If you have nothing going on after debate camp, I suggest you read it. It's actually a pretty good book. In the book, he writes as a diplomat advising a ruler, and he says that we should seize all the territory you can, maintain friendly relations with minor powers, but do everything you can to keep great powers down. <coughs> Don't get involved in alliances, and more importantly, 
Traditional morality is abandoned in state politics. There is no such thing as a moral state. The reason this is important, twofold. One, self-interest. States must pursue survival, and they do that through power. And second, because survival is a priori to the state, they're absolved from any moral duties. So Thucydides said that, look, the way that states engage in the international arena is they attempt to balance each other. When one state rises, the other state has to do the same. That makes conflict inevitable. Why does this matter for Latin America? There is, yes. Um, I was just going to say, like, <clears throat> most plans are going to have, like, an advantage scenario, like, the economy or something to that effect of the topic or target country, and that'll inevitably facilitate or cause the rise of that. Sure. We talked about how right now, in La you're exactly right, we talked about how right now in Latin America that Brazil is a larger power. All the other powers, Venezuela, Colombia, Cuba, Mexico, smaller than what Brazil is. U.S. economic engagement will spur their growth. How other states respond to that matters. So lessons from history. These concepts can explain what will happen through economic engagement. More recently, in the case of classical realism, Morgenthau. set out objective laws in political science, meaning that all actors seek to maximize their own power. He took what Machiavelli said and he says, look, requiring and evaluating policy is based only in power. But the state needs to act to consolidate its power at all costs, and there is no moral standards to how the state involves itself in international relations. So because conflict is inevitable, because states attempt to balance each other, because there is no higher power that they go to, international relations is anarchic. States will fight for their own self-interest, and they do this without morals. All right, then came along the greatest man ever to live in the 1900s, Kenneth Waltz. And he took what history had said is true, that there's the balance of power, that there's no morals involved in states, and tweaked it a little bit. He inserted that the anarchy that exists in international relations means that a state can be attacked at any time. Therefore, your survival of the state is always at risk. When a state knows this, it always has to act to con concentrate its power. <clears throat> Two ways the state will act. First, to make sure it's better than anyone around them. Two, if you must, form alliances to increase your own power. So, these four authors, what have they done to change the way a realist, or what neorealism will do for the world, it's five things. One, states are inevitable. They are the primary actors in international politics and will be for the foreseeable future.
the practice of power politics, the way the states engage each other, is inevitable. That friendship is just smoke and mirrors. That states are really out for their own self-interest and will only be your friend if it's to their best interest. Just like, well, never mind. If you don't have a PS3, you're definitely going to be a friend with someone that does just so you can play cool video games. Right? You're, you don't really care if they're cool or not, but they got a PS3. Second of all, the international system is, is anarchical. It's, it's pure anarchy. In your notes, you should put this. There's a writer called Hedley Boole. He writes a book called The Anarchical Society. It's a great read, especially if you want to be the type of debater to go for realism. If you want to say realism answers other schools of thought and other caves, you should read that book. Headley Bull. B-U-L-L, Headley, H-E-D-L-E-Y. It's called An Anarchical Society. But, this suggests that there is no hierarchy, there is no overriding authority in international relations. More importantly, any time there is conflict, the state can resolve it with force. This concept of neorealism, neo this we can resolve any conflict with force, was the Bush presidency. His foreign policy was large hawks from the neorealist camp that believed we should shore up one sole hegemonic power. We should invade whenever there is conflict. Right? You can see the way it worked. Think of Iraq. Think of the way Bush ran the war on terror. Three, security and survival. This is the part of realism that shapes debates. That states behave in similar ways despite having different cultures and economic systems. Discussions about cultures and economics are secondary. The state itself, because all states don't have an overriding authority, will behave in similar ways. Regardless of your culture, regardless of your economics, that state will seek its own survival. Because of that, we know, or the US knows, or international relations experts know, how they will react. That there's unitary and rationality within the state. What I just said before. And finally, fifth is power. We can predict how a state will act because the state will always try to consolidate power. If given a choice of conquering a smaller state to gain more resources, a state will do that. It's out for its own self-interest. When we talk about power and why states are interested in their self-interest, what does Latin America have that the world wants? Resources. Resources. What specific resources? Oil. oil. Let's just use oil as a prime example. States within Latin America will attempt to consolidate that oil. Outside actors such as the United States, Russia, China, attempt to use economic engagement as a way to coercively gain access to oil. So what does this mean? We know the system is anarchical. We know that states act in their own self-interest. We know that states, when given an option, will consolidate power and probably conquer each other. So what does this mean for international relations? One, policies will be written in ways to allow states to maximize that power. 
Two, states will arm themselves, they will bandwagon, and they will balance. Who knows what bandwagoning is? Yeah. It's kind of when you decide, it's, it's a type of propaganda, really, that gets everyone on board with something. Sure, call it propaganda, but when we talk about the states, it's literally like a state, because it's out for its own self-interest, will begin to bandwagon with larger states. You won't want to tell Brazil no if you think Brazil can conquer you. And finally, it sets up a security dilemma. The largest criticism of neorealism and realism in general is that if it's true that states will always attempt to balance themselves, and if they're successful at it, that will increase their own security, but at the same time, it decreases the security of others. This is a very important concept. If it is true that states act in their own interests, if it is true that they pursue power when they can, if they begin to arm themselves, what will other states have to do? Right. So as, you, as state one increases its, its security, state two has insecurity. Proliferation is due to what the security dilemma has created. If your neighbor has nuclear weapons, what do you need? Exactly. That is a security dilemma that's created in a realist system. <clears throat> so, other criticisms of neorealism. Things are important to note because when you read the K and a policy team answers it with realism inevitable, and makes arguments to why realism is good, here are the questions you should be asking of those arguments. One, why do you believe that states are the only actors? The neorealist school of thought believes that the state is the end and of itself, that populations don't really matter, The populations fall in line with the state, that we should only talk about the state. The idea that the states are only interested in power, or more likely military power, ignores important issues about the construction of the state. Remember, a central, central tenet of realism was the idea that states act in their own self-interest and they rarely join with another state. Remember, you want to preserve your own state whenever possible. Well, that seems to be a problem with unipolarity. Neorealism neo cannot account for why unipolarity exists. Second school of thought, liberalism, or neoliberalism. Spurs from an author named Immanuel Kant. His major work was a book called Perpetual Peace, written in 1795. He makes an argument that says reason, and using reason, it's critical in interaction. <clears throat> that the idea that the system is inherently anarchy or that states only pursue power isn't necessarily true. That there are reasons outside of that. He also says that a world without conflict or peace requires the following three things. For states to be representative democracies, for there to be international law, 
and we have to have the ability for free movement of people and free trade. From this, a large theory of idealism began to emerge. It emerged because, as a response to World War I, we saw a failure of the balance of power politics. World War I broke out because the power balancing didn't work. So idealism said, in order to stop another war, we should decrease the incentives of war, i.e., we should make war costly. Which favored the advancement of technologies, and more importantly to the idea of neoliberalism, it increased economic interdependence. Okay, this is important. Raise your hand if you don't know what economic interdependence is so we can talk about it. Okay, who wants to take a shot of what it means to be economically interdependent? Yeah. Countries depend on each other to be uh, economically stable. Yes, economic inter that's a great definition, that the stability of a country, the stability of countries requires trade amongst them. That the idea that if, if I trade a lot with you, Anderson, if you and I are economically beneficial, if I trade you whatever materials you need and you trade them to me, that decreases my incentive to go to war with you, right? Because we have a harmonious relationship with the status quo, why would I want to go to war with the person that provides me whatever material I need? So economic interdependence is the foundation to what we now see as like a free trade system. The World Trade Organization founded upon the belief that economic interdependence makes war impossible. The next thing that idealism did was it brought through the resolution through international institutions. We begin to see for the first time things like the League of Nations, which is kind of the foundation for large global alliances and what the UN has become. That if international institutions exist, if we have a place to resolve conflict peacefully, if we have a place that can monitor global trade, the incentive for war decreases. From there emerged democratic peace theory. Liberal democracies have never fought a war amongst themselves. A representative democracy has never fought a war with another representative democracy. It's not that democracies won't fight wars, it's that they don't fight amongst themselves. The movement to democratic peace was supported by twofold, information and institutions. Institutions allow for debate. If we have places like the UN, the World Trade, and large institutions for places to come, the Free Trade of the Americas, the FTAA, all of those mean that people will have debates or discussions to where their intentions can be revealed means we avoid the security dilemma. If we talk to our neighbors, if we have institutions that spur common ground, we don't have to worry about the balance of power. And finally, institutions itself says that elected leaders would lose office if they lost wars. So they'll be more careful about going to them.
Yeah. Here's the thing about democratic peace. One, democracies don't fight each other. Autocracies often do. And information in institutions decreases the chance for conflict. One, information means we solve the security dilemma that realists prescribe. And two, institutions mean that people will try to avoid conflict because they want to be elected. Okay, so the key tenets of liberalism. The reason to why liberal and neoliberalism is a large product of international relations and the way that we should see the world. One, humans seek survival, but they also want happiness and freedom. That it's not always about just security survival. That we also enjoy being human. That we like our own freedoms. That the system of anarchy that exists on the global scale, it's not lethal. What is, is state authority that acts upon power relations. A central tenet to neoliberalism is they use history to show that progress is possible. The past 100 years is often a, a critical standpoint that people talk about, but more importantly, neoliberalism loves to talk about the past 60 years post-World War II of being free of global conflict. And they say things because large institutions and the spread of democracy has meant more states interact with each other. They also cite economic interdependence. What are more and more countries doing these days? Trading, right? And finally, they know what collective security is. That states operate within their self-interest and that international regimes can set rules for how states should operate. Neoliberalists love the idea of the United Nations. They love the idea of large international regimes controlling the way states interact. Okay. So, how do we compare realism and neoliberalism? Realism is pessimistic. It says that the nature of anarchy cannot be altered. That states will always act in their own self-interest because there is no authority that guides them. Liberalism is more hopeful. says that humans have the ability to alter the environment by creating political institutions. So neoliberalism believes that large international institutions create stability. The debate between these two schools of thought in international relations is not sterile by any means. There is no conclusive answer. You can see the difference between liberalism and realism in all kinds of different global political events and isolate why states act or why they didn't act. slide I put it here twice okay third final theory that we'll talk about constructivism is uh, one of the newest theories in international relations as far as when we talk about uh, non postmodernist theories like Marxism 
Constructivism draws on sociology, specifically the work of Max Weber and Emil Durkheim. I said that name correct or incorrect. And their work focuses on the power of shared ideas. It attempts to merge, in a lot of ways, neoliberalism and realism through sociology. It begins from a thesis that what states want is a fu function of who they are. It is a function of who they are. In both neoliberalism and realism, we look at states upon what they are. Constructivism steps away from that and it says it's important upon who states are. What makes them up? The logic of appropriateness is in many ways why constructivism differs from the rationalist thought of, ne of realism. Realism and neoliberalism will say that there's a logic of consequences, that actors strategically calculate costs and benefits. Constructivism is different than that. That they believe actors behave in accordance with their socially constructed and, and sense of self-identity. That people or states don't behave on a basis of cost benefits, rather, they behave with their socially constructive sense of self identity. That the culture of the state creates the identity to which the state engages in the world. It begs the question of what identity is then? What is a state identity? Constructivists say that that is an understanding of who the self is in relation to the other. So in neoliberalism and classical realism, we have an us-them mentality. There's us and there's them. Constructivists say that that type of paradigm is inaccurate and bad. That instead, we need to construct who we are in relation to the other person. That it's not just us and them. That we can have a relationship with other people, other states. Our identity isn't based on what we're not. It can be based upon who we are. That identity creates interest. Constructivists believe that there's norms to the way states interact. There's constitutive and regulative norms. The idea of sovereignty that a state is free of its own choice, that's constitutive. The regulative, regulative norm is a norm given to their identity. So states are free to choose in some and most examples of, of their interaction and it guides their behavior. That then creates expectations for how states should behave.
That expectation allows for the explanation of why conflict should not occur. All right, there's some problems with constructivism. People say it's not specific enough to be testable, that the idea of relying on the identity of a nation is impossible. You can't use theory to prescribe action then. It's unclear which factors are cause and which are effect. In realism, we know that states act in their own self-interest, therefore cause and effect is easily explainable. In constructivism, it's less clear because their interests can always be changing based upon the identity of the state. And it's very difficult to understand that identity. So when we try to compare them and we look at human nature, realists say that people are aggressive. Liberalism would say that people are materialistic, that we care about our economics, that we care about what we have. And constructivists say that people are shaped by their culture. This idea of human nature, right, is the central standpoint of where the criticism and in international relations begin your affirmative, if it's like a policy act, it's like we should do the plan because it prevents terrorism, solves a global war, whatever. You're acting under the idea of a realist notion that maybe people are aggressive. Your plan that maybe supports just economic engagement and says that free trade can solve war is a form of neoliberalist thinking that says that people are materialistic, they'll want wealth. The trade independence will prevent conflict. A constructivist affirmative would maybe detail away from policy and look more about how people are shaped by the culture. Where do we find research into these theories? Realism is a historical outlook at the world that predicts the future based upon that history. Realism looks at economics, and obviously constructivists choose sociology. We should study the people and their identity to know who the government is, what the government will do. We should know the economics of the situation and will predict the outcome. And the, real, the realists would always say, there's a history lesson to this. States will act out. All right, part two, IR in Latin America. Currently in, in Latin America, these are general observations. They're not specific to every country. There is a lack of political and economic development overall. There are countries that are emerging. There are countries that are backsliding. How the U.S. seeks to engage will change the outlook to what Latin America does. There's a large presence of international peace in Latin America. It has been free for international conflict for a long time. However, there's an absence of domestic peace. There is a lot of civil strife and instability in numerous countries. The lecture on Venezuela highlighted the instability that's currently going on there. The discussion we had about Brazil and the World Cup is another one. The amount of drug trafficking in Colombia creates large civil strife. There isn't a strong power projection entity within Latin America. Meaning that the amount of balancing or bandwagoning that happens in Latin America is relatively low. Yeah. Um, a little lack of power projection. 
Are you saying that there isn't, like, outside of Latin America, one country that has predominant influence, or within it there isn't one? Um, well, with, outside of it, I would say the U.S. is pretty powerful, but within it, like, there's, it's not exactly like Venezuela is power projecting with a large navy, right? It's not like Brazil is, like, steamrolling outside of, there's no conquest of a Latin American country outside of Latin America. However, within Latin America, there's a large relevance of regional international relations. There are implications that spill over from one country to another. The way that we engage Venezuela in many ways could directly change the way Colombia policy is set. Engagement with Cuba, lifting the embargo, would fundamentally change the way the United States operates in all of Latin America. So small regional implications become super important to larger policies from outside countries. There is a large strength to Latin America that has been absent of interstate war since 1883. The realist school of thought would say we're, that means everyone in Latin America is satisfied with their territorial status quo. That countries are not concerned or worried about other people balancing them. Liberalism would say, yeah, that's exactly right. The spread of democracy and economic independence has worked. Latin America will continue to be free from conflict. Constructivists would say what has emerged is a framework that prefers peaceful re resolution over war. So all three schools of IR theory will attempt to explain why the absence of conflict is due in a large part to their school of thought. So from the constructivist perspective, it doesn't really say why that cultural framework that diverse peaceful resolution has emerged, only that that is the reason that... Yes, the uh, problem... Okay, I don't want to say the problem. I think that a large way that constructivists fell to their application of theory is they couldn't give a specific reason why, because that would be outside of... That would be identifying too much, too, co too much cause and effect. So they'll just say that a cultural framework, that the culture of the independent states favors non-conflict more than conflict. So basically any of, any of these theories won't actually say, like, define things to any specific examples, right? No, you're, you're exactly correct. And that's the problem. When we talk about international relations, we talk about what it means for, like, policy versus the critique. It's just a debate about which school of thought is the better form of engagement. There is no correct or incorrect answer. Future engagement with Latin America follows the theories this way. Realism will say that the U.S. should only engage Latin America based upon our own self-interest. Latin America countries will continue to search for autonomy from the United States. This is currently playing out in this way. Large other powers such as China and Russia are attempting to engage Latin America. The question in front of the United States now is, is our self-interest worth new engagement with Latin America to prevent other powers from being involved? Neoliberal standpoint from engaging Latin America will stem from poverty. Pro poverty remains in Latin America a terrible <coughs> socioeconomic problem. 
They would argue to give them more institutions to support economic development. They say that Latin, uh, liberals would say that Latin America has a failure to take advantage of globalization. I typed that twice, I apologize. And they would say that this is for two reasons. One, that there's a weakness of the political institutions. So maybe affirmatives will somehow increase political authority in there. And two, the problem is the role of the state. Constructivists look at Latin America, they say that there's a diplomatic culture. And that culture has used international law to regulate behavior. That countries within Latin America have, for the most part, attempted to be free of conflict. Three reasons why they know is one, a principle of non intervention. <coughs> Latin American countries, for the most part, stay out of each other's business. They often become strong allies with other countries. If you look at Venezuela, because of Chavez, large partners with Cuba. Now that Chavez is dead, we'll be interesting to see whether or not Maduro has the policy power to continue that. They're often consensus seeking. And there's some equality to the states. All right, so that's IR, the way that international relations will attempt to engage or how the lens can be used to see why the different theories are important in Latin America. What do we know about U.S.-Latin American relations and what does it mean for the implication of the topic? First, uh, the literature is overwhelming that says U.S.-Latin America relations are at a critical juncture, that there is a unique time both within the United States and Latin America to seek engagement or to move away. The reason being, one, in the United States, the economic decline of 2008 has decreased the amount of regional engagement we've had in the Americas. Our interaction with a lot of Latin American countries is at an all-time low simply because we don't have the money to do anything. At the same time, those Latin American countries are, have more stability overall than they've had in the past 100 years. So the U.S. has an option, either engage now and submit relationships or withdraw and let other countries do it. Our focus instead of engagement has been upon the war on drugs, the Cuban embargo, hating Chavez, he died, though. It, that's a, as you learned in the Venezuela lecture, that is a, an important moment in U.S.-Venezuela relations and whether or not they'll be set forward again. And for a large part, our Latin America strategy has been based upon access to energy resources. The reason why we're debating this topic right now is because there is so much literature about why our relationship has fallen off and why it's important to restart it now. What are the motivations for change in, in, in our relationship? The first is Brazil. Brazil is rising real rapidly. It's now, it's now Latin America's dominant economic power. Its influence rivals that of the United States. I guess it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next five months of stability within Brazil with uh, people like rioting and whatnot, but for the most part, Brazil has a large influence. It is the sixth largest economy in the world. So Brazil will definitely care about what happens to Latin America countries. It will be either angered, 
some can argue, are made happy by U.S. engagement with Venezuela. Brazil is noted for its effective political leadership and its skilled diplomacy. Earlier I talked about the idea of a Brazil counterplan. There is a lot of research that talks about why Brazil is in the best position diplomatically to leverage policies in Latin America. The saying, anything, I can, anything you can do, I can do better than you, or whatever that is like that, I just like George Bush that same thing. But whatever that is, that's Brazil in the region. They strongly believe that anything the U.S. could do, they could do better. Brazil's relationship with the United States is largely cordial and non-conflictive. There have been some areas of disruption or disagreement but for the most part, the two are our allies. Our other motivation for change in the region is China. China is pursuing a large policy of economic engagement with any and all Latin American countries. The reaction to this from the United States is important. Some scholars feel that that's China messing around in our neighborhood, like in our own backyard. The reason for that is because Latin America, for the most part, has been our staging grounds. China's involvement will also change the economic competition in the region. The United States has long been the sole trade, the sole trade partner to Latin America. As China increases its economic engagement, that could change. All of this is highlighted by energy security issues. Uh, I think, in probably someone from uh, that's working on the Venezuela affirmative, I think the United States imports something like 50% of its oil from Venezuela. I mean, it's like ridiculous. So, our relationship to Venezuela and our relationship to other Latin America countries is tied to our energy security. Allowing competitors like China into the region could cut off the amount of oil or energy security the United States has. And then there's the neoconservative fears of just China in general. You'll see tons of articles written that's like, the dragon is at our back door, they're staging for another attack, China will invade the US, Red Dawn. The other motivation for change, like I said, China here, you can replace everything I just said with Russia. Russia and China are actively pursuing a policy of economic engagement with Latin America. Okay. Democracy is, you know, not exactly awesome in Latin America. But it's pretty good. There are beacons of democratic hope in a lot of different countries. And there's also a large fear that democratic countries in Latin America could backslide because of economic conditions. Backsliding meaning that they could go from a democracy to not a democracy. So a lot of authors say that engagement with any of the topic countries, Mexico, Cuba, or Venezuela, will help send a message to other Latin American countries that democracy could be as a good thing. As you read definitions of economic engagement, you will historically tell that we've often tied it to changing a country's makeup, their governmental, political, and economic makeup. Economic engagement itself is pro-democratic.
And it's Latin America, it's energy, it's ultra diverse. There are possibilities for multiple different second generation biofuels. Oil will be a really large affirmative on the topic, but so will second generation biofuels. There are countries that can grow sugar, soy, and other crops that can be used to fuel biofuel technologies. Obviously oil, we've talked about it. NAFTA has created unique manufacturing concerns in Mexico. The U.S. has a really big reason to engage now to settle those manufacturing concerns. Over the past 20 years, more countries have been offshore, more companies have been offshoring and leaving Mexico and the United States for Asia. Solidifying NAFTA, solidifying a larger regional base in Latin America will help bring back manufacturing jobs. I don't know why I put energy. That's just supposed to say impacts. So I did a bunch of different searches, and these are the impact arguments that will be very relevant in all of your Latin America debates. The first is proliferation. There are some good 2013 and 2012 articles about Brazil, Argentina, and Venezuela all choosing to maybe go forward with nuclear power projects and offshoots of different types of proliferation that are possible. The argument will go something like this, that U.S. economic engagement in Latin America is key to its credibility. U.S. credibility determines proliferation. Latin America has a lot of drugs. There's a big cocaine trade there. Whenever we talk about drugs, we talk about narco trafficking. And whenever that exists, it works well with the other one just below it called terrorism. There's a diverse amount of literature about why Latin America is the new terrorist staging ground to go into the United States. Now that the war on terror has been successful in decreasing Al Qaeda's power in Central Asia, in the Middle East, that Latin America countries can serve as hubs for terrorist networks to possibly bring an explosive device into the United States. I'm not going to talk about energy security again. I think we have enough. There are multiple different economic impacts in all different varieties. From free trade to decline to specific trade sectors. Another impact to Latin America is climate change. And its internal link is deforestation and biodiversity. So if you didn't know this, there's a bunch of rainforests in Latin America. Um, the other day, I don't know if it was in lecture or in the large lab, we talked about carbon sinks. I think that was in Dr. McFarland's lecture. Carbon sinks, there's a lot of them all throughout Latin America. U.S. policy to change or alter the economic behavior to decrease the amount of deforestation will curb global climate change. Oh yeah, the economy thing. I was going to mention one large thing that's in Latin America. Do you guys know about the Panama Canal? Okay. What? It's being remodeled for the... Yeah, the Panama Canal needs a huge remodeling. Uh, the remodeling debate probably won't matter that much, but the Panama Canal is an access point for global trade. So it's not that just that free trade is good or bad in Latin America, it's just that trade routes that have been created throughout the globe hinge upon access through the Panama Canal. Yes? Um, if you, have to, you guys go back and look at the map and look at the two countries that are just south of Panama. One of them is one of your countries, which is Venezuela, the other one is Colombia. They 
Oh yeah, instability in those countries could definitely spill over to impact the way that trade goes through the Panama Canal. That's an excellent point. All right. So, I have a quiz for you. <coughs> or an exercise, if you will. All right, think about this. This is learning from our lecture. Why hasn't the global nuclear, why has, wow, why has, whoa, why hasn't global nuclear war and or the most powerful weapon in the world been used even once in the past 60 years? Don't raise your hand. Why would a realist, a neoliberalist, and a constructivist say, Think about it. We'll get there in just a second. Write it down. Come on. See if you're right. All right, someone want to take a guess what a realist would say? Why we haven't gone to war or why haven't a, we a weapon been used? Yeah, you were first. To protect itself from other threats. What do you mean? Like, um... Well, why hasn't it been used? Oh, I thought, I thought you said it has. No, no, we definitely have not used, like, the largest nuclear weapon we have. Right. Um, to conclude World War II, we definitely dropped an atomic bomb. But why haven't we seen, like, arming and, and security dilemmas happen to where we go to war with each other? Yeah. Uh, the primary goal of the state is to pursue security and survival, and based off of the assumption that all states behave in similar, similar ways, if a nuclear weapon were to be used, then that would sort of cause retaliation and backlash. And, yeah. Yeah. What's your name? Nicholas. Nicholas, yeah, you, I'm just you. yeah, Nicholas is exactly correct. That security and survival are best guaranteed by the non-use. A realist would argue fourfold. One, deterrence. That countries are deterred from using weapons because they know other countries could use them as well. That, two, the damage would simply be too devastating. That if states act in their own self-interest, if they always want to pursue power, the event of the use of a, a weapon that large would devastate it too much. Third, more importantly, that alternatives are available. There are other ways to settle conflict other than nuclear weapons. Conventional warfare. And the fourth thing they would say is that the use of the nuke is irrational. That rational leaders would never conclude that. All right, anyone want to take a guess of why the liberalist or liberalism would say? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, you're exact. I was going to wait till you finish. Yeah, you're correct that the interest in freedom and cooperation means that there's no use. Specifically, like you said, economic interdependence. Second, the spread of democracy. And third, a multipolar world, i.e., alliances and treaties prevent their use. Good job. Okay, what would the constructivists say? Yeah. You. Yeah. So, no one would be a victor. Sim, sim, close. You're close, but not that reasoning. Like that's a more of a realist reasoning. Because we'd all die, we don't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah, there's international taboos. We saw what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The whole world saw it. 
and everyone knows the destruction that could happen, so there's now international taboos against their use. That states act as a community, and they have shared ideas. And because of that, they don't want to have the same events. Do you have your hand up? Yeah, no, no, you're exactly right. That the, the way that relationships work, that we like other states, that we have a shared sense of community, all reasons to why there's taboos against the use of nuclear weapons. Okay. Um, well, good job. I don't have anything else to talk about with international relations.